um, Yurik is his uh, uh, Yurik. Yeah, is his nickname. I always I'm very self-conscious when I pronounce other people's names. So uh, anyway, Dr. Ademski is originally from Poland, and he currently works at the Munich Research Center as well. However, he heads up a different uh, a different uh, program there, a different department there uh, that has some beautiful machines. You should ask him about his his sequencing machines and his uh, extractions and. And it's, it's a beautiful lab. It's a very old building, um, which as an architect I'm rather interested in, but it has this fantastic technology in it. So uh, he has been, this is your second conference, but uh, the, the first conference he came to Philadelphia, and he had a scheduling conflict in Cambridge last year. But uh, he's, he's a very good friend of ours and a, and a long-term proponent for him. So I'd like to welcome uh, Jurek Ademski. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. I'll give you a presentation um, as a scientist, basic scientist. And uh, the background is around myself as um, training in endocrinology by chemistry. Uh, today, I will bring you the idea uh, how to use metabolomics to understand health and disease. Uh, I will walk you through different uh, aspects which are being applied to the uh, understanding of the as well. First of all, a few remarks about our environment. Uh, upon my arrival, a picture to the left, uh, it was quite uh, motivating to stay inside. So the next morning, um, I decided to go outside to meet him. And uh, this is just an example of how the, uh, our environment could influence your behavior. And as you can see, the same situation, the same setting, has a completely different appearance. So our environment is changing. Um, those who have uh, seen my uh, presentation in Philadelphia remember maybe this slide, that uh, we may face different uh, appearances of the same gen uh, organism. Uh, so to the left, you see the caterpillar, which is uh, definitely the same genome as a, uh, as a butterfly. So as previous speakers described it, this to you, the genetics has uh, information about the predisposition and as well what can happen, but it does not uh, really describe you what will happen. And today I will bring you the idea of metabolomics and explain how it could be uh, used. I'm going deeper into the human phenotype, you know, from butterflies to human reality. And I'm showing you this um, <laughs> Definitely, this uh, two pictures to the left and to the right. Both Greek. We expect that the genome has not changed, but the phenotype has changed. So, so environment, life, style, uh, for example, the summary of the letter, nutrition has changed the phenotype, the appearance. Okay? Obesity is not a disease, but it could be associated with it. <clears throat> um, I'm using right now the definition of metabolomics to bring you into the field. So in metabolomics we are studying signatures of all molecules present in a sample. So all possible metabolites in a given sample. We'd like to know what is the association of these metabolites with a given phenotype. How can we learn from this from these metabolites uh, something about the disease or health uh, genetic behaviors? Let me introduce you to the complexity of the metabolomics. Um, when I was young and beautiful, the biochemistry was very simple. We had one enzyme and a reaction, and it took us several years to complete that with the PhD study already. So you have here a conversion of uh, um, non-biologically non-active estrone at, at the position of uh, 17. You have then 17-beta-estradiol, uh, which is a sexual hormone. And this gives you an idea that one enzyme uh, converting these uh, molecules, uh, one protein, which is coded by one gene, is already influencing the lot. It's a sexual dimorphism to this situation. Now, over the years, uh, we have learned that this is not the only uh, steroid. There are hundreds of steroids. And uh, the green uh, depicted here have hormonal activity. The others are uh, intermediate. This gives you the idea how the complexity of metabolomics is addressing the reality of metabolites. We are talking not about one 
do metabolites at the same time, but hundreds and thousands. To present this um, information, we use uh, association of uh, given molecules to pathways, which are um, uh, stored in data banks, for example, uh, Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes, where you can read out what is the association between the given molecule and the uh, reaction behind it. So this information is stored. Now, most important information is, of course, what are these molecules for? And I will give you information, uh, what are the metabolic, metabolomic signatures which has been observed already um, using um, analytics of different uh, phenotypes. First of all, the biggest impact of our metabolic composition is a uh, simple fact being women or men. This makes the biggest difference between us. And I'm referring only to metabolic compatibility. Now, there are several other functions which I would like to just, uh, describe here. First, of course, is the food. Um, everything you digest, you drink, uh, will be showing up in your organism as well. Uh, so on the overall, we have something like 40,000 different metabolites in our body. If you are a vegetarian, this could be even 100,000. Um, the situations like um, stress, uh, for example, talking to you right now is changing my metabolism. Uh, alcohol intake is definitely impacting uh, specific molecule, and this is not uh, what I'm referring here, uh, just uh, uh, fatty liver appearance, but as well the ability to uh, be phys physically active. Smoking, uh, physical activity, medication, infections, hormonal status, and the circadian rhythm, all of them they have very specific signatures. So if you compare a uh, smoker to non-smoker or never smoker or somebody who has given seven years before um, or ago, uh, you can tell them without uh, looking into the questionnaire. It's possible to tell what kind of exposition to the environment, what is the uh, uh, fingerprint in your, uh, in your body. Usually my students wake up when I'm talking about the alcohol and they ask me whether it's safe to drink on the, over the weekend or use uh, just a beer overnight. And this is a question of toxicology and exposition to environment. So if you're exposed to the higher dosage of whatever is not good for your body, this is toxic effect. If you have a smaller dosage of the same uh, uh, substance, for example, phthalates from uh, um, uh, bottles uh, where we had water today, okay? It's a chronic exposition which leaves as well um, traces. Let me uh, tell you how it is possible to analyze the metabolome. On this uh, picture, you see the example of sugar, which uh, uh, this is a chemical formula, which I would, uh, let's say, use this uh, abstract model to introduce to you um, the concept of metabolomics. Uh, so imagine experiment, we would like to measure uh, sugar in a sample among other metabolites. I will be using this symbol for sugar. The metabolomic experiment would like that, that uh, we have a sample collection, we prepare samples, we perform separation and measurement using specific instruments and then we perform uh, bioinformatic analysis. Okay, let's start the most important part. Uh, this is the mass spectrometry and the situation before we separate. So um, the molecules in our body and environment, they are never alone. So now instead of one ball, you see a lot of balls, okay? And imagine uh, that in your system, you would like to see only this ball but the situation is a little bit different. So everything is changing. It means you are looking at the sample at the given moment. It could be, for example, blood sample in the morning or blood sample in the evening. After the meal, postprandial effect or before. 
So this is a challenge for metabolomics that you would like to see a lot of molecules and they have different concentrations at different time points. Now to to use um, uh, we, we're using mass spectrometry to analyze these molecules. I'm introducing to you the concept of quadrupole. So we have four rods, yeah, four rods, which are covered with gold. And uh, there is an electromagnetic field applied to every road with a radio frequency. Now imagine that the sample, these balls I was showing to you just a few seconds ago, they are flying this direction. Okay? And by using uh, the electromagnetic field applied to the four roads, you are able to separate, separate the molecules of interest one by one and measure the masses. It means measure the, uh, uh, describe the identity. This is a principal mass spectrometry. It looks like that, that I'm tuning the machine to let only the uh, ion of interest to go through. And the others which are not fitting to my measurements are not going through. It is repeated for every molecule I am interested in measuring. By doing this over and over again, within two minutes, I can measure something like 400 metabolites. This is how the mass spectrometry assay would work. So once again, we have a system, sample, sample preparation, separation, mass spectrometry. So what are the outcomes of such metabolomics experiment? Uh, we are measuring not only one molecule. I was using sugar as an example. We can measure many others, like amino acids, like lipids. At the same time, we are getting information about the concentration of metabolites, information about the assignment of this concentration to a given effect, for example, health or disease. And the uh, fun starts, uh, the really uh, work starts when we are looking where the molecules are located in specific pathways. So what are the processes around? And this is done using bioinformatic uh, methods. And symbolically, we have a situation in which we have uh, three molecules of interest, amino acids, uh, lipids, and, uh, uh, and the sugar. And we're looking for the association between them and the disease. Now, this is a bioinformatic process which could be symbolized by this short movie. Starting from very simple association, we are getting more complex. And at the end, the situation is giving you the confounders, the dominating, the um, metabolites which are uh, associated with a phenotype and those which are associated with other effects. Now, let me give you a few examples where the metabolomics has been used successfully. And I'm starting with a newborn screen. This has been introduced in the 70s worldwide. And actually everybody born after 78 in Germany has been screened for that. And this is um, an assay which is using the metabolomic approach and uh, diagnostics is done uh, for several inborn errors of metabolism. How is it done? Uh, small kids, you cannot uh, uh, touch without waking them up. So only a few drops um, are being collected, and the drops are so small that they are dried on filter paper. Okay? This filter paper can be sent to the laboratory doing mass spectrometry. And in this laboratory, several metabolites will be assayed. And based on that, which metabolites are present or not present, they, there is a diagnosis um, possible. Uh, this is an example of phenylketonuria, which is an uh, inborn error uh, uh, leading to the development of disorders, uh, seizures, uh, as well as mental retardation, if not treated. Uh, what happens here is um, the situation in which phenylalanine, which is coming from food, is not metabolized to tyrosine and to the neurotransmitters like uh, melatonin and so on. The uh, accumulation of intermediates at this level is cytotoxic to neurons, uh, which is uh, to be avoided. 
And the treatment in many cases uh, is um, simple. It is simply the method of using a uh, uh, phenylalanine low diet. In practice, it would mean that uh, you are avoiding fish and eating more uh, corn and potatoes, something like this. There as well chemical treatments. If applied in early development, so for newborns, uh, this is uh, improving very much the phenotype and is abolishing actually the disease. So one example of early screen. Another example is the development of early diagnostics for diabetes type 2. And this is uh, uh, our pancreas, which is dysfunctioned in the diabetes. So uh, all the overall diabetes, if untreated, leads to severe complications. And I know that in Pura syndrome, uh, there is as well a question about the connection to sugar levels. That's why I'm bringing this example. That's why that uh, diagnostics uh, based on sugar and other metabolites uh, has to be done as well using this method. So what we have developed is uh, a biomarker panel which allows for the very early detection of uh, development of diabetes type 2. On this cartoon, you have two panels, left and right. The first one is discovery, which is done in a population where you don't know which biomarkers could be affected. And second one is the replication, which is um, uh, targeting uh, people with known disease, and you are just verifying if the biomarkers are correct. Without performing these two steps, the biomarkers are useless because they have been not confirmed. So in this specific example, we were able to distinguish uh, normal glucose tolerance from impaired glucose tolerance and people who are, were all the way to develop diabetes type 2. These individuals could enter uh, treatment with metformin, uh, a sensitizer for insulin, or have... Uh, some other uh, life-changing um, treatment like uh, more sport and all a different diet and they can stay in this status and this is uh, actually preventive medicine showing how metabolomics could be used for the uh, early diagnosis of a disease. Another example I would like to bring to you it's our recent uh, uh, research this is on circadian rhythm this is something you, you know, but you don't know this is called like that. So this is uh, the ability to be uh, physically or mentally uh, very uh, creative and active at specific time of the day. Uh, so I'm early uh, bird. I have some students who don't wake up until noon. So this is circadian rhythm, and this is something which is uh, tolerated in the society uh, if you would like to be very creative. Okay. So how is it done uh, uh, hormonally? In our body, the melatonin is responsible for the night phase. It's high in the night phase. This is a hormone. And the glucocorticoids, like cortisol, is high during the day. So you have reciprocal patterns of melatonin and uh, glucocorticoids. And this, this is in no normally regulating your rhythmicity. This is uh, regulating not only your physical activity but the whole metabolism. It means if you eat during this time, for example, having a jet lag, you are not really um, um, doing well because this, this food, this um, um, integration of metabolites into pathways is not perfect and you are wasting a lot of uh, nutrients. Now we did a very specific uh, experiment in which we have analyzed uh, circadian rhythm in mouse model. We kept mouse on a low fat diet, so-called chow diet, and high fat diet. So this met, uh, mouse get fat, uh, this one was lean and spotty. We then uh, sacrificed the mice and we analyzed uh, metabolite concentrations in different tissues. Okay, In both cases in different tissues. Now all this Colors here show the correlation of metabolite interactions between different tissues. For example, a liver secreting something to blood, brain communicating with muscles, and so on. So every single strain, uh, strand here 
depicts one correlation for a given metabolite. The different colors respond to the positive or negative correlation. The message out of this slide is that if you are exposed to a high fat diet, the whole uh, uh, correlation between the tissues goes wrong. You can see it. The intensity is less, and there are different connectivities between the tissues which have been non-existing at all. It means that our metabolism is very sensitive to changes in the rhythmicity, and you can uh, imagine that uh, uh, signal transduction molecules like uh, steroid hormones and neurotransmitters could be severely affected if you are exposed to the um, uh, stimulants in, in the wrong phase. Being a teacher, I see these effects quite often. But somebody in the audience uh, has, uh, it's an idle, so, so stealth state. The uh, neurotransmitters are down, but the brain and the whole metabolism somehow is still functioning. And it's enough to have, let's say, a, a joke set during the, the talk, where people activate within seconds. <laughs> and it means that this is a process which is um, just arrested. This is idle state. This is not a down. This is something in between. Now, what can we learn from these old examples? The metabolomics can give you information about that uh, which is not provided by genetics. We cannot explain, for example, why the, uh, um, the diabetic um, epidemic, diabetes type 2, is present now worldwide. The genetically, we have not changed our genomes. Okay? But it could be that this is an epigenetic uh, effect, or is it microbiome effect? Using metabolites, we can explain processes which are leading to that. Mm -hmm. Now, what can we do with metabolomics for, for pure? What is going right now? Uh, you have heard it already that the mouse model for alpha is being analyzed right now. We are in a pilot phase. We have accomplished several measurements. Uh, together with uh, Jen, we will be doing further experiments. I uh, think the pilot phase will be um, uh, accomplished uh, by uh, next spring, so they will be uh, much progressed by that. Human cell lines are in preparation right now. Uh, we heard today uh, why is it so important to have different uh, ten lines prepared uh, nicely genetically to have models we can interpret. And um, we are in um, study design, design phase for human samples. Technologically, we are ready to measure any amount of uh, human samples as well, but we won't start until we know everything about the confounders and the requirements for this study. So what can metabolomics provide? Uh, Definitely from the past experiences and those which we are gathering during the uh, pilot experiments, uh, we think that uh, early diagnostics could be as well possible. So it would be a supporting diagnostics to that done uh, by exome sequencing. Uh, we can uh, definitely identify which metabolic pathways are affected by disease. Why? is epi epsi present? Why are the seizures present? Uh, we will be able to provide the information about disease progression in sense of uh, stratifying high-risk patients, which supports the therapy decisions. Okay, And uh, definitely this is what has been taught today already, that uh, when you know the, the, the pathway, the whole process behind uh, disease and uh, targeting uh, for um, new treatment as possible, and definitely will be providing that. Uh, from the last example in the Sirkadayan written, you have learned that uh, the therapy might be more efficient if it's applied in a specific time window, and this is as well something I would like to provide. Now, something quite different. Um, I would like to present to you as well this idea how I'm uh, receiving your presence here that um, the situation changed a lot. Um, my message uh, today is that the, the patient or patient organizations are very powerful, and the science is listening to you. 
Um, uh, you probably have seen this uh, movie, very good, nice uh, movie, Lorenzo Soil. And this is an example uh, when parents are not giving up uh, uh, their own son and they are developing against the decisions of uh, environment. Um, uh, a simple procedure which helped their son. At that time, uh, being a like uh, activist, being a part, uh, parent, was not enough to push the science in the, into specific uh, direction. Now we have completely different uh, situation. Rare diseases are um, uh, very well percepted. Uh, there are different organizations which are supporting that, and the, the board of uh, foundation is very aware of this, and uh, I'm looking very forward to contribute from my side to the development of this. Just to give you an impression, where is it developing as well, is that I have uh, edited a book, uh, Metabolomics for Biomedical Research, which is going to be out in Amazon probably in January 2000, uh, 2020, yes. And it's a book uh, published by Academic Press, Elsevier. It's a book for scientists. It's not for, for parents. But it's, it's um, uh, I have noticed through uh, different con uh, discussions in, in meetings I'm attending that the many epidemiologists or clinical researchers would like to have a reference book or uh, they don't want to, to look through all possible reviews. They would like to have something, um, a guide to successful metabolomic experiments. So I have collected top people from the, from the whole world, from Australia to uh, United States, Germany, UK, and so on. And uh, we're very happy that this book will be out. So please don't buy it if you don't like it. Um, <laughs> but this is for research only, okay? Um, I would like to disclose that all research I was presenting today was supported by the European Union grants depicted here over the last seven years. And this, as you may notice, this work uh, is uh, an outcome of uh, work of many talents and many people who are involved uh, in developments from the industrial developments in Austria and United States through different uh, universities, and Qatar University as well, and bioinformaticians and uh, people uh, working with uh, clinical phenotypes, and my group with uh, present and past students. This is my last slide, and I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>